I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. So it's been a big week in my household. We have a new eight week old Australian shepherd, puppy. Her name is Ruby Sue and she's amazing. And sometimes she can be a little bit of trouble, but for the most part, she's been incredible. We've started training and I'm learning a lot about dominance and a lot about training the dog, how to treat you. And I guess that could be said for humans dealing with other humans too. It's just gotten me thinking about this relationship that I have with this dog or building and and growing with this dog, and my husband is too, and how much that first impression and that first set of interactions matters to a relationship. So there's a little bit of food for thought for you. Today's guest is Tony Shea. Where do I even start with Tony? He is the CEO of Zappos.com. He has been a friend of mine for nearly 10 years and a mentor and investor. And Tony is a visionary. He really has a unique lens when it comes to business, but also just in life in general. Tony is extremely unassuming. And one thing that I think I love most about him is that he is so humble. He has done some pretty incredible things in his day, and you will never hear him brag about the things that he's accomplished or even really talk about them. In fact, there are a few times in this interview where he mentions the internet companies that he's been involved in. And the first internet company, which he will never mention or really talk about, was Link Exchange, and it was sold to Microsoft for $265 million when Tony was 26 years old. So that was his first big win, and he's had many since. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He loves pickles. One of the things I love about Tony that I especially appreciate after this interview is that he pauses and thinks before he talks, but sometimes I need to do a lot more of that. In fact, editing this interview has been quite interesting because there are so many pauses where Tony just is extremely intentional about everything that he says, and he gives it thought, especially when I ask him pirates or ninjas, which is tougher. That was the longest pause because he was truly, really thinking it through. That's one of the things that I also love about Tony is that he can uh, he can bring fun to a lot of situations just through his his interesting logic. Well, here's Tony Shea. I can't wait to talk to you on the flip side because there are some gems in here and uh, I hope you enjoy. Before we get started, I want to tell you about my partners at Design Pickle. You know when you're in a pickle because you need a design, but you don't have the time or maybe even the skill to do it yourself. Many of us have been there. Design Pickle has been a lifesaver for me. Here's how they're set up. You pay a flat rate monthly fee and you're given a dedicated designer for all of your needs. You heard that right. Unlimited graphic designs, unlimited requests, and the first 14 days are risk-free. 
you get a full refund if you cancel in the first two weeks. Why not now, listeners like yourself, get 30% off their first month at Design Pickle? You can go to designpickle.com forward slash why not now to redeem the offer. For me, the process has been painless and ego free. In fact, many of the posts you're seeing on my social media channels were created by my buddies at Design Pickle, specifically Jacob at Design Pickle. That's what's cool is that you get a dedicated designer. I'm on a first name basis with my designer. A mentor once said to me, just because you can doesn't always mean you should. Do what you're uniquely qualified to do. Design Pickle helps me do just that. Go to designpickle.com forward slash why not now to redeem the offer. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery. Yep, the original before you go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you know what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit poopery.com and why not now listeners get 20% off with code why not now. That's all one word. Also, you can now get Poopery at Bed Bath and Beyond. Tony Shea, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Great. How are you doing? Good. Has happy hour started yet by chance in Vegas? Uh, not yet, but maybe after this uh, this recording. So the only thing between you and celebrating National Beer Drinking Day is, is me? Is why not now? <laughs> oh, I forgot it was that. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think there was a festival going on uh I was celebrating that as well, and uh, and then actually right now outside they're setting up bike fest. So I'm not sure exactly what types of bikes. I suspect there's drinking going on over there as well. Having spent a couple of years in downtown Vegas, National Beer Drinking Day is kind of almost like every day. So I don't know what really happens there if it amplifies the the consumption or what, but. It should be interesting, at least. So kicking right off into your why not now, and I can only imagine how many moments you've asked yourself why not now. In fact, as I was preparing for this chat with you and thinking it through, there are probably more times that you could count where you easier to count where you when you didn't. Um, so can you think of a time when you got to a moment and you just decided, okay, I need to you know, do X, Y, Z, and this is this is it. It's happening now. I'm making this decision. And can we kind of zoom in on it and look at that day and that time and how you felt, what you thought, what you did uh, when you asked yourself, why not now? I guess there's probably been a number of different instances because I've always been pretty entrepreneurial. So whether it's uh, in college running a pizza business or after college starting a Internet advertising startup with a college roommate. Those were those were all things that at the time seemed like it might have been a big decision. But really, I think if you're going to do it sooner or later, might as well do it sooner. Has been kind of my philosophy. And I guess for me, rather than kind of get overwhelmed with everything, I just try to just think about, okay, what's just the next step that needs to happen? And then that ends up just being a lot more manageable and not overwhelming. So for me, it's really just how do you just take one small step forward? And and there's actually a great book, I don't know if you've read it, called Getting Things Done. Yes, you recommended it to uh, me before. Yep, I I read it after you told me about it a year or two ago. Yeah, and, and and I hadn't read that book till I think just a couple of years ago, but it kind of subscribes to the same philosophy. There's like all a big project is, is just a bunch of small things added up together. And so rather than think about all the things that need to happen, just focus on basically what's the next action. The very first next thing. I remember that advice and it was as I was going through a big transition uh, with digital royalty and, and, you gave that to me and it's 
really helpful, right? Even in little projects or big, huge life things. Um, and so like going back to your college days when you did decide to um, have your pizza business, can you share a little bit about what made you do that? So there was a moment when you realized, okay, I can do this. And I kind of know the story, but for the listeners who maybe don't, what happened in your mind that day? And then how did you navigate through the decision and getting started? So I lived in a dorm that had probably about 300 students or so. And I think it was the six or seven stories tall. And they had this area set aside downstairs where people would hang out late at night. And there was this food area set aside. And uh, every year, a different set of students would run the place and they would serve burgers and shakes and so on. And basically at the end of each year, there would be something like an auction, basically, where the next year's students get to bid on and, and buy the rights to that space from the prior year students. And so it was one of those things where I happened to be at the meeting where they were doing other things as well, but one of them was auctioning off the space and basically figured, oh, we would just bid on it and see what happens. And if we won, then figure out what was the next next thing to do after that. We, we really didn't really have a plan. It, and so we ended up winning the bid. And then I think that was that was as far as our as, as far ahead as we thought. And we're like, well, I guess we have to figure out how to sell pizzas now because that, that was the original idea. We thought pizza would do better than burgers. And so I had to look into it after that, figuring out how do you invest in pizza ovens and how do you hire employees and get supplies and so on. And I, I guess in some ways it's almost like we forced ourselves into the situation and so then had no choice but to go forward. And I guess for some people it's probably an analogous thing to if you make an agreement with a friend to meet with them at the gym, then when it, you know, the next week or the next day when it's time to show up, you can't really say no because you're already committed to someone else that you're going to do something. I think just that holding yourself accountable, doing something that's a little permanent or at least secure enough to where there isn't an easy way out. Sometimes I catch myself doing that, buying a ticket to go do something or start something um, because then you don't want to backtrack and either lose that money or fall through. So it's it's an interesting kind of tactic. And I think I had heard another version too. Was there at some point a pizza business that was being run in your dorm and then you or someone, your roommate, decided to buy the pizza and sell it for more on a different level <laughs> of the building? So it was actually the same pizza business because we were on the ground floor and then it was Alfred who later on ended up, uh, we ended up being partners in various internet businesses together. Uh, but at the time, he was a student, and he was actually buying the pizzas from myself and my roommate, and then taking them upstairs and selling them off by the slice for <laughs> a higher profit, because his roommates were too lazy to, to go downstairs. Uh, okay, that's what I remember hearing, it was Alfred. So I was thinking about when we first met, and we met through a direct message on Twitter, probably 2008-ish, and um, ended up meeting kind of a funny story. I was looking for social media policy advice for my HR department at the Phoenix Suns, and Zappos was the only company that I could find that was really using primarily Twitter without intentionally doing it, but humanizing your brand, right? You're encouraging your team and, and everyone that worked there to to use it for communication, but it was more for culture and to get to know each other from what what you had mentioned. And and as we then exchanged and ended up meeting in person, which was really an interesting first meeting. I think we went on a hot air balloon, right? Um, yep. We, we had this discussion about the science of happiness. 
and the three types of happiness. Can you talk a little bit about your entry into that when you started to really kind of study it and why? You know, the the topic is obviously a big one, but it was a really fascinating conversation and and it stuck with me with the three types and we can talk through that, but what really got you started in that? It was just kind of an evolution. Uh, we originally, so Zappos was founded in 1999 and the original goal or vision was just to be the number one footwear retailer online. And then that kind of evolved over the first few years into really want to build the brand to be about the very best customer service and customer experience. And with the hope that in maybe 20 years in the future, there could be a Zappos hotel or Zappos airlines. That's just about delivering the very best service. And so as we started going down that path, we realized that also really importantly was making sure that our company culture was strong, that we had a strong service culture, that employees were happy. And and so kind of realized that things that tied the customer service thing together with the company culture thing was happiness. There's trying to make customers happy, trying to make employees happy, and then also applying that same philosophy to our vendor partners and our investors. And so I guess that's what led me down just reading up more about the science of happiness because I started learning that a lot of things that people think will make them happy don't actually make them happy in the long term. And it could be anything from how you think about compensation for employees to how do you reward uh, employees or or customers, and and then the, in, in terms of the three types of happiness that you just mentioned, that's one of the frameworks to view things through, and they have different lasting effects. So there's pleasure, engagement, and meaning. And so pleasure is the kind of shortest lasting type of happiness, which is some might call the rock star type of happiness, where it's all about chasing that next high and it's great if you can sustain it but the problem is it's actually pretty hard to sustain unless you're essentially a a rock star and Mm -hmm. and so as soon as whatever that source is that's giving you that pleasure goes away then your happiness level just drops right back down almost immediately uh, back to where it was and then the second is about engagement or also referred to as flow where when you're so engaged in some activity, it could be, and it's different for different people, it could be running or it could be painting, for example, or playing music, that time just flies and you know, three hours might pass and it only feels like 20 minutes and you lose a sense of self-consciousness or even self because you're so engaged and that's actually the second longest lasting type of happiness. And then the third type is about uh, being part of something that's bigger than yourself that has meaning to you, and that's actually the longest lasting type of happiness. So, for some people, that might mean volunteering for a local uh, charitable organization, for example. And I found interesting is most people go after life trying to chase after the first type of happiness and then go after the second, after in their minds, thinking they'll go after the second after they figured out the first and then go after the third after figuring out the second when it really should be done in the reverse order. And and essentially, in the ideal world is you want to layer all three of those types on top of each other. And so we've done a lot of thinking about how do we do that for employees and for customers and also for my, myself just in my own personal life as well. And it's a nice um, checklist to go through. There's a, there's a few other frameworks that are analogous like Maslow's hierarchy, or um, there's also a lot of research that shows the number and uh, strength of your relationships is really important to your happiness and also your physical longevity. And so these are all things that I try to be more conscious of, whether it's in business or in my own personal life. And with that that scientific knowledge and then also kind of looking at, at your experiences, can you think of a time when maybe the, the the three were not aligned and how you overcame that, what you did to to shift 
um, where there maybe there was a time there was more kind of rock star pleasure happiness um, that that was throwing things off balance a little bit, or maybe even flow. I guess maybe uh, even just take the early days of, uh, or, or take that first internet company that I was talking about, where we the original goal of or reason for doing it was just because we thought it'd be fun to do a startup, and then we'd grow it, and then eventually sell it off. And so there wasn't really a greater purpose to the company uh, the way there, this is with my previous company, Link Exchange, uh, as there is, say, with Zappos, where it's about trying to change what customer service means and how companies think about making employees happy and so on. It's more than just about selling shoes. And so for the previous company, there really wasn't that aspect to it. And also, we just didn't know any better to pay attention to company culture. And so by the time we got to 100 people, not everyone that we hired was great for the culture. And uh, I, I remember waking up one day and kind of dreading going to the office myself to my own company and realizing that it, part of the reason was because the culture had gone downhill and part of the reason was because there wasn't really a, a purpose to to the company. And so I guess with Zappos, wanted to make sure we didn't make that same mistake again. And so I, I think that's how the whole company culture and customer service and, and higher purpose and stuff, why that was so much more of a focus at Zappos than it was at my previous company. And what brings you joy? Um, I think just being around people that, being around friends that are where everyone's just, I guess, comfortable being themselves and where, I don't know, just, just enjoying each other's company. And right now I love the, I live in a, so, Airstream Park, where we actually took over half a city block in downtown Vegas a couple of years ago and then brought in 30 Airstreams and tiny tumbleweed houses. And the original goal was to basically create an almost like an urban version of Burning Man, where we have campfires going every night and different residents live here and, and friends of the residents come through. And so on any given night, just going out into the campfire, we'll run into random people. And so I think I, I love that uh, combination of hanging out with people and also uh, just the random people that you might run into on any given night. And there's some pe- sometimes there's someone playing guitar around the campfire and other times there's, uh, there could be some random debate about artif- the future of artificial intelligence or, or, or something else. And, and I think just that kind of, I guess, having that type of serendipity in life on a regular daily basis. Um, for me, it's pretty, pretty inspiring and, and energizing. It is uh, cool to hear you talk about it too, because the, the Airstream park, it is kind of this communal, amazing environment. And I, I lived there for two days. I don't know if you remember Tony, but I did actually uh, give it a oral and I absolutely loved the, the ability to, to connect and feel a part of something the second you walk out your door. Uh, but what you've done with it since my since I've been there or uh, was there, it has been cool to go back and visit. So you have a llama, Marley. Is it just one llama or do you have a couple now that roam around? Yeah, we have two alpacas actually, oh, a alpacas. black one and a white one. Lots of dogs and kids running around. And um, yeah, it's not something you would, expect to find in the middle of downtown in probably any city I'd say. No, and that's the that's one of the things that I've always loved about you the most is just the the vision of and why not have an Airstream park in the middle of downtown Las Vegas with two alpacas. You know, it's just why not? And looking at that kind of mentality, I was thinking about when we decided to partner up with my company at the time, Digital Royalty, and how that came to be was so organic. And I think it lends some insight in your, maybe the way you approach deals or just um, negotiate or maybe lack thereof, because it seems like it's such an organic kind of intuitive fit. Um, Well, at least it was 
with us. I remember being texting you or actually messaging you from 30,000 feet. I was on a flight somewhere. And we basically exchanged a little bit of information um, because we had known each other for years and and been more friends. And I consider you a mentor, but had never really talked about business. And and then it occurred to me, wow, maybe I should ask Tony about this and investing. And the company had already been established, of course, but this was a time of um, bringing other people in. And and by the time I landed, I think we pretty much had things figured out. <laughs> and it was the most unique experience having, you know, gone in to that process and with other individuals and, and entities, it's usually not way necessarily. And um, do you have any any insight on, is it intuition that, that you tend to trust? Or, you know, even in times where you'll tell people, well, what do you think is fair to be paid? And you have this art about the way that you come to those decisions. Um, can you shed a little insight on that? I think things never turn out the way you predict they will turn out. So rather than try to, from my point of view, expend all this energy into all these what ifs when chances are 99.9% of those what ifs aren't going to happen. Just I, I'm a big believer in just going uh, and, and trusting your gut and intuition. And it's, that's not to say that it won't ever be wrong, but I am a big believer in, uh, I forget which book uh, that Malcolm Gladwell wrote. I think maybe it was Blink. His whole, you need 10,000 hours of practice to be really good at something. And so that could be, you know, to be a good golfer or to be a good piano player, you need 10,000 hours of practice. And I would say the same thing is true for training your intuition in a particular uh, area. And so your intuition may be uh, wrong more often in the beginning, but it's a learning process just like anything else. And uh, I would say if you actually do spend 10,000 hours of practice and, and, and basically try to be more intuitive in your decision-making then your intuition will get better and better. Because I know people that want to approach decisions very rationally and make a, say, uh, on a piece of paper, divide onto two sides and what are the pros and cons of a possible decision. Um, and, and what's interesting is, so, so I know some people that do that and then you know one column will rationally be better than the other and so they go with what rationally is correct if you're just looking at that piece of paper and a lot of times they end up actually not happy you know down the line with the decision they made um i actually just read about uh someone was advising actually the best way to make a decision is to go through the effort of making that and listing out all the pros and cons on a piece of paper and then after you're done with that then throw the paper away and then make the intuitive decision and they, they said that gets you the best of both worlds. Interesting. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I'm, go- I'm going to try that. It's kind of a, um art and science in a way, but I like the step, the sequence of events. And given all of the, just the world you operate in and with the downtown project and all the investments you've made over the years, do you feel like the concept of of chasing the unicorn has become a problem or or maybe um, taken the the focus off of what really matters. Are you referring to in Silicon Valley? Yes. You're probably referring to real unicorns, were you? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, those you should definitely continue chasing. But, um, (laughs) yeah, I've been pretty removed from the – San Francisco tech scene since we moved to Vegas back in 2004. So it's been 12 years now. So I guess we haven't really been uh, caught up in all the uh, stuff involved with that. And so I guess it's hard for me to speak specifically to each company, whether it's Uber or another company, as to whether that is a good goal or, or not. Like definitely there's certain company business models that just require massive amounts of capital in order to scale properly. And Uber, it sounds like it might be one of those. So 
maybe that is the right decision for a company like Uber is is to raise a lot of money at at a high valuation. But then maybe for other companies, they're the event the pro, the cons may outweigh the pros because at some point you need to pay back the investors, and the more money you raise, the the more you owe mm-hmm. at some point. And I guess my my angle in that question, and even the tech fund that that you have, or just seeing entrepreneurs, it seems as an entrepreneur myself, and having been more on that side of things, that the the burnout and the desire to be either <laughs> chasing that unicorn or nothing seems to be kind of black and more black and white versus being okay with growing a company slowly and and or growing a company to a certain level that's that's supporting your lifestyle or you know what you want it to be but uh, sometimes it feels like to me we romanticize that um, kind of chasing the unicorn type of of goal or lifestyle yeah I mean I guess I it just depends on each individual entrepreneur's personality but the other thing that plays into it is really whether who you're raising money from or whether you're raising money. If, if you're not raising money then uh, and kind of bootstrapping it yourself, then there's no rush to get to any growth level or as long as you can make sure that you just get to cash flow positive. And beyond that, there's plenty of entrepreneurs that are happy just running businesses that may not be growing a lot or, or even at all, but if they're not declining in revenue, then they can spend a lot more time not worrying about the business, but really just enjoying life. I, I think it really just depends on each person's personal preference. Uh, but I would say that if you are raising money from a venture capitalist, then they do have certain growth expectations. So it's just one of the things you need to really think about before actually raising money. Mm -hmm. I guess we could bring that back around too to the the different types of happiness as well and just that that balance. Um, Are there any kind of underestimated um, trends that you are seeing, whether it be in tech, whether it be in um, different types of of companies or industries? I'm pretty concerned about the future of artificial intelligence. If you go to, to... Tim Urban's blog, waitbutwhy.com. He actually has a pretty good long uh, write-up about why essentially artificial intelligence may end up destroying and killing all of humanity within a within our lifetime. So that's pretty scary. And what's interesting, if you ask all the people that are uh, in that industry, it's generally not a question of if, it's a question of when. And so uh, I think for people that haven't been paying attention to it, it sounds kind of far-fetched and uh, science fiction almost. But if you actually do some reading up on it, it's it's pretty scary. To add t- to that, and I guess just kind of ask about um, well, your thoughts on on AI, machine learning, and you know, at what point artificial intelligence reaches human level intelligence. Um, it seems like there are a a lot of opinions on kind of defining first of all what that really means of human level intelligence. But the power, the the roadmap seems to be really in the hands of the people who are financing, yeah, the development. How do you think consumers and just individuals can have more of a say in how fast and when and where uh, AI goes? I don't really know if really there's much control over it. I, I think that would be like if I if I told you that the one way to so- stop uh, super artificial intelligence from destroying humanity was if we shut down the internet within say by the end of the year. I don't even know if, how you one would go about trying to do that and I, to me I think the internet is pretty much uh, impossible to shut down just because it's so uh, distributed and and so on and so I think same thing is gonna is true for just the progression of technology. There, there's a book 
called What Technology Wants, I think, something like that for the title, where it really just talks about how the progress of technology is inevitable, and you see examples from history where almost the exact same technological inventions or discoveries happen in completely different geographic locations. So, so it's not like one random brilliant person will invent the next technology. It's going to be, it's just a matter of time and, and it's going to keep progressing. And so in terms of time frame, I don't really know, but I think the general consensus estimates are somewhere between 15 years and 100 years from now. By the time we realize that it's coming, it's going to be, Already. Already. I think, by then too late and, and, and progressing very quickly. It is a fascinating topic, that's for sure. And I think the education and awareness is, is obviously key, at least for people to have a better understanding of um, what to expect, but also where they might be able to make an impact in guiding. And um, switching gears for a second, something I ask um, all of my guests is, how do you keep your mind healthy? So how would you answer that? Um, I like to read a lot. So it's whether it's different books or usually friends of mine will forward me articles and, and vice versa. And so I'd say that helps with just learning about new things and, and about different industries. That's probably the main thing I, I try to do. I know there's, a, there's, there's some, I guess, the equivalent of board games that friends and I play that require some focus and concentration so yeah those are fun late night games to play and when it comes to things like meditation or journaling or those types of things have you have you tried meditation not formally uh i I think i i do certain things where i don't know if it counts as meditation but it's not sleeping because i'm still conscious but i do feel after doing it for 10 or 20 minutes that i i feel uh, my brain feels more refreshed, so maybe it, I'm meditating without knowing about it. But one one of the things I do sometimes, for example, when like I just need a break from thinking or doing stuff, is lie down and try to actually focus on feeling my pulse through the uh, blood vessels that are running through the gums of my teeth. And and I don't know if it's just me or I don't know. Maybe you should. And let me know if it works for you. But basically, in order to feel it, you kind of have to block out everything else. And 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 for me, it's, I have a hard time with just saying, "Oh, just stop thinking of stuff." As and I think that's what you're normally supposed to do for meditation. And for me, it's easier to say, "Okay, I guess in meditation they tell you to focus on your breathing." And this might be the analogous thing: it's focus on the pulse uh, that are like on the gums of your and or in your mouth and for me that is easier because you have to really focus don't normally feel the pulse there and and if you can then that means you're not being distracted by other stuff i like it so yeah it's just shifting the focus onto something that's that's not really allowing you to have those other thoughts that you have to swat away but Very interesting. I'm going to give that a try, and I will let you know, Tony, how that works for me. Um, The blood vessels in your gums, that's that's going to be interesting just to kind of even focus on in itself, let alone how they feel. So you have a very unique philosophy and methodology for your email uh, management. Can you share a little bit about that just briefly? Because I think it's such a cool time management tip. Yeah, so I wrote it up a while ago, uh, I think a few years ago. So if you go to the website yesterbox.com, yester as in yesterday, and then box like email inbox, uh, you can read more details there. But the short version of it is that basically uh, rather than worry about the never-ending treadmill of emails that are coming in every day, and if you respond to one, then someone else responds, and then you to the one you just sent and then and then you need to respond to that one and it's just it can be very um, demoralizing or, or mm-hmm. just without having that sense of progress uh, what I ended up doing is basically every day the only emails 
I, I basically try not to worry about responding to emails that come in today. And instead, I'm just focusing on clearing out yesterday's inbox. And so then there is actual, actually a sense of progress. You know how many you have at the beginning of each day to go, to go through. And then it takes a bit of practice and willpower and, and, and discipline initially to not get caught up in the emails that are coming in today or to not feel the need to check them every you know, every 10 minutes to see if you got a new email. Um, what I do is actually I'll go through for every pick a random number, every 10 emails or 20 emails that I get through from yesterday, then as a small reward, I get to then check the latest emails that have come in and then, and then switch back and forth. But, but generally try not to reply to the ones that are coming in today unless it's time sensitive. Do you think that's helped train people how to communicate with you in a bit, like in terms of their expectations of either response time or maybe are they using other forms of communication with your team, with your media team? I don't know if really anything can't wait 24 hours for the, or 99% of emails can't wait 24 hours. I mean, everyone else is, is so busy doing stuff, you know, unless it's something that needs to be taken care of that day. I just tell people to, in that case, text me or something. I like the ability to kind of add some control or perceived control to it. And like you said, have be able to have a sense of accomplishment. It can get quite just overwhelming. So that's that's awesome. The why not now question for the future for you as far as, you know, you've done so many different things and and why not now doesn't seem to be a super tricky thing for you as it is, but is there anything rolling around in your mind that that you think is is kind of time now to to tackle something that it's time to get your why not now on. So one of the things that that book I mentioned earlier, getting things done, talks about is making sure that anytime you have a random idea about something, uh, if you're not gonna, if it's just in, in a, a brainstorm idea for now, to just put it into your someday maybe list. And so the other thing the methodology talks about is once a week, and I usually do this Friday early afternoon, do your uh, weekly review, which means going through your priority list and see what's going to review the past week of uh, things you did and see what's coming up for the next week. But one of the items is also go through your someday maybe list. And I think a lot of us, and definitely me in the past, would come up with some random idea or or it could be, oh, we should do a trip to the Galapagos Islands one day or whatever. And then maybe a month later, you've forgotten about that until someone randomly brings it up again. And so I guess having that discipline to do the weekly review every Friday afternoon, which in, takes a few hours, and um, but it includes going through that someday maybe list, and for me is really making sure that all those ideas don't for, don't end up getting forgotten. And as your life priorities change and so on, you can maybe delete some of them, but basically it forces you for once a week to ask yourself, why not now for each of these someday maybe things? And and so I guess for me, I, I'm kind of in the habit of, uh, I guess before it, I was kind of more intuitively uh, asking that by default. Uh, whereas now it's even formalized into this weekly process of really, do I, is this still interesting to me as an idea or as a possible trip or business idea? And if not, then should remove it from the list. And if so, then is this week to the week to just take the very next small step towards enacting them? Making it happen. I love the someday maybe list. Uh, in the past, I've kind of considered that the idea graveyard or the idea garden, <laughs> where you put it, kind of shelve it, but actually having a list. But then you never look at it again. If exactly. It's the idea graveyard. It's dead, right. But if it's a garden, you're planting a seed that you may want to water later that you could revisit. So maybe my Evernote will be my idea garden. Um, that's That's very interesting. So are there any 
items on your sun someday maybe list that that you have decided you are pushing forward? There's a giant piece of art from Burning Man called the Big Rig Jig that went up maybe mm-hmm. a month or so ago, and it's basically two tanker trucks that have been folded on top of each other, and it's forty something feet high. We put it in this now abandoned U-shaped motel uh, in in kind of the courtyard area, so it, it acts almost like the lobby display of that. And we've been kicking around the idea for a while of actually one day maybe building a hotel there uh, or residential, and I'd say maybe um, maybe a month or two ago, actually decided we're going to move the Airstream Park to that side. It's right across the street, but now it'll be behind this big sculpture that's oh wow and and that was one of those ideas that was like oh maybe someday but then we actually just decided someday was was six weeks ago (laughs) awesome we'll have to check that out next time i visit and that's it's inspiring just to know that that's kind of your process because these don't have to be long lost things that you debate over every you know once a year revisiting that list weekly makes a lot of sense and um quick rapid fire questions and i know we have to hop here in a few minutes but uh first is what are you reading right now or your all-time favorite book so i just finished reading a couple books uh that are more about systems thinking so one is called thinking in systems and another one is called organized for complexity the organized for complexity is actually uh super quick read. It, it takes an hour and a half. It's, it's got lots of great pictures, and we've been actually asking uh, the, or suggesting to a lot of people, whether inside of Zappos or outside, to to read those books because they really talk about this whole concept of self-organization, but more from a how to think about it from a systems perspective. And there's also a book that I started called The Seventh Sense, which is it is also about systems, but it's more in storytelling form and gives examples from history of how, how certain things used to work. Uh, but now with the new world where everyone's networked, how different things are. And uh, yeah, I think those are the most recent books I've touched. Very interesting. I'll check out both of them and put them on the Shelfie Club uh, list, which is my book club. And what keeps you up at night? I don't know. I don't really have trouble sleeping, actually. That's if anything, I wish I could. There's time for more sleep. We just had the Life is Beautiful Festival here uh, where we fenced off 18 blocks in downtown Vegas, and it was 100,000-something people over three days. And so I think for the past week, everyone, whether it's in preparation for that or during it or trying to recover from it and catch up on on other work stuff, <laughs> probably been averaging four hours of sleep a night yeah sleeping is not the issue (laughs) gotcha it's more of just getting enough i use uh the withings watch now to track my sleep which i love i know that you're withings um user as well and pirates or ninjas who's tougher maybe pirates but it's really not based on intimate knowledge of either (laughs) intimate knowledge Okay, we'll go with pirates. That's that's good. Um, I'm also a pirate fan. Uh, when it comes to toughness, I believe they have the edge. And what advice would you give to your younger self? And you can choose the age. This is the last question. Yeah, so sometimes I have college kids ask me the question for them or, or first-time entrepreneurs, and I'd say my advice is pretty much the same. It's be unapologetically true to yourself, and if you – broadcast who you are to the world then over time your tribe will find you love it wow that's a great way to wrap up well thank you tony i appreciate you taking the time with me and being on the why not now show and um thank you for the years of inspiration and support and i am so grateful uh, for all of that great talk to you later (laughs) thank you Be unapologetically true to yourself, and if you broadcast who you are to the world, then your tribe will find you. Wow. How about that from Tony Shea? Absolutely love that line. 
And it's true. And he's proven and demonstrated that it's true. I love the amount of intuition that's blended with logic when it comes to Tony. Sometimes things are so logical and and simple and you think, why didn't I think of that myself? Or why haven't I done it that way? He's just very uh, creative when it comes to the art and science of how we go about things. So I hope you enjoyed Tony as much as I did. Always inspiring. I think you can now understand how I've learned so much just by observing him and his actions. And you can follow along with what's going on with Tony on his Instagram account, which is Downtown Tony. And you never know what you might see. You might see some alpacas, you might have, who knows. I trust that we will all be creating our own someday maybe lists that we will be referring back to on a frequent and regular basis. That was one of my key takeaways is oftentimes we do have those ideas that are big ideas at the moment, and then we get busy and we might not revisit them. But if it's something that we're constantly reviewing And we can change that list. Some things might fall off. Things will be added. But it keeps it top of mind versus this kind of dream book that we put on the shelf and never revisit. So cheers to the someday maybe list. That's pretty much the why not now list. Quick update from last week on the kindness.org initiative and launch. So over the last week, we've had people from Sydney, Africa, all over the U.S., Israel, New Zealand, Australia, I could go on and on, who have joined the Spread Serotonin Initiative. And Kindness.org in general is just doing incredible. We have had more than 20 million views within the first 72 hours of launch. Over 150 countries have visited the site and taken action, and it's it's super exciting. So check out Kindness.org. Take a look at the different initiatives. There's no strings attached here. We're not trying to sell anything. We're just trying to spread kindness and also research kindness so we can better understand the impact. And thank you to everyone who has done an initiative, especially the hashtag spread serotonin initiative. Huge high five to you. I can't thank you enough. And for those who have not yet participated and joined us in the hashtag spread serotonin initiative. There's still plenty of time. You can go to amyjomartin.com forward slash kindness and check out all of the directives. It's very easy. It makes you feel good. It makes an impact and a difference. So uh, why not, right? Why not now? I've seen so many inspiring why not nows from listeners. And there was one specifically that really struck me this last week. So Missy wrote in and she said she's applying the why not now question to small things and large things in her life. Little things from whether or not to accept invitations or to decline certain things that don't fulfill her. And uh, she mentioned that she likes to listen to the podcast when she gets up in the morning and goes on walks. She is starting her career all over at age 48 and she's a single mom with three teenage boys. And it's just very heartwarming to hear that the people are really taking a serious look at their life and asking the why not now question. And as a reminder, it can be something little. It can be something big. It can be something light, not a big deal. It can be something huge and really heavy. It's all about just kind of practicing that mentality of asking, why not now? Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now?